The talk of peace in Yemen doesn't drown out the cries of the war victims. Hatab's still a teenager, but he's lost both his hands and his sight and all hope for a better future now. His body is peppered with shrapnel wounds, many still lodged in his chest. He doesn't seem aware of how severe his injuries are, and he won't be able to get the specialist help he so urgently needs inside Yemen. His father appeals to us to get his son medical help. He needs to go out of Yemen, he tells us. He's a human. There are lots like him, but look how he's suffering. They can't make artificial limbs quickly enough to cope with the growing number of amputees who need them now. But creating prosthetic legs are easy in comparison to electronic hands, which are very expensive, so they mostly do cosmetic arms. This only for cosmetic, not for... Only not, a cosmetic hand? Yeah, yeah. yeah not, it doesn't to, move? Not functional at all. Mm, it this, doesn't do anything? Yeah, it doesn't do anything. Many of the amputees are children. There's a whole generation like Abdullah growing up maimed and mutilated by this long war. Most of Abdullah's 10 years have been spent living in this war zone. He still has ambitions to be a footballer and is a taekwondo enthusiast. But his life's going to be tough and anti-explosive teams know he won't be the last to suffer. How can I help my family and friends, Abdullah asks. He doesn't want them to go through the same pain. You can tell them if they see anything suspicious, do not touch it, do not touch anything. Anaya lost her leg during what was meant to be an agreed truce between the fighting groups. The 13-year-old has learned how wartime agreements are no agreements at all in Yemen. She shows us on her good leg how doctors had to cut more and more of her wounded limb to stave off infection, which still hasn't healed seven months after the explosion. Her family's traumatized about the day she got blown up by a landmine left in the street. Anaya's since dropped out of school and says she's no friends now either, but she still has dreams to get justice for war crimes. My dream is to be a lawyer, she tells us. I was thinking I'd learn English and I want to study to be a lawyer so I can fight and defend those who need it. But first she's got her own fight on her hands, to heal, and every five days she comes here to get her wound cleaned. It's a constant tussle between nurse and patient. Keep your hand away, he says. Don't tell me what to do, she screams. Don't do that, he says. He's worried about more infection. It hurts, it hurts, Anaya sobs. It's acutely painful, and she's had seven months of this pain. It's turned into a regular battle of wills. But they are the best of friends. Few believe she'll be the last of Yemen's war wounded, or it's really nearing an end. No, it's not. We're still in the middle of the war. Not no peace is coming. It's depressing. Yeah, we're depressed here. Everybody is depressed. Yeah. There's still much insecurity here, despite a recent lull in fighting nationwide. The whole of Taz seems like it's one big minefield sometimes, with civilians living right in the middle of it all. There is a small Yemeni team tasked with clearing, but their international funding's been slashed as aids diverted to conflicts like Ukraine. Often, they can't even afford the paint to show a path's been checked. The Halo Trust, which gets some British funds, is now inside the city. And one of its priorities is warning children of the dangers of unexploded ordnance. Many of the homes here are incubating explosives which have yet to detonate and the Halo Trust will assess the risks and aim to remove what they can, starting in the next few weeks. There is a constant threat in this particular neighbourhood of items being fired from that front line. Um, I believe yesterday was the latest incident. There was a mortar which was fired slightly further down in Dawa. This war has torn apart lives and torn off limbs, and the options are very limited for survivors like 10-year-old Nadar and her older sister. Nada's considered lucky because she has an artificial hand, 
which she struggles to put on to show off to us. When she finally manages it, it's quickly apparent it is more of a hindrance to her. When I push my arm inside, it feels painful, she says, when my bone touches the artificial bit. It's less than six months since her arm was blown off and her new artificial limb is already broken and utterly useless. Nadia tells us she wanted to be a doctor, but she doesn't think she'll be able to now with just one hand, so she's aiming to study to be a mind clearer. I don't want others to be affected like I have and to go through what happened to me, she says. That's why I tell my siblings I'm going to be a mind clearance woman. And not one of us who hears her doubts she'll do exactly that. Alex Crawford, Sky News in Taz City, Yemen.